This lecture has been made available to you courtesy of the American Numismatic Society. So, okay, so well, welcome, welcome to my uh, uh, study in Nyack. Uh, this is where I work. Unlike the people who were on TV, I did not have a builder come in and construct bookcases behind me so I would look good. They're my real true bookcases. Um, so I first became interested in bar. I first uh, became interested in bar Kokhba coins when I when I lived in Israel in 1967, and I've been paying attention to them ever since. So what I'm going to tell you about is uh, conclusions after 55 years, uh, while absorbing all of the things that Leo Mildenberg and Yaakov Mesherer and Nasrallah Suhuri and all the other experts and Dan Barag uh, helped me learn. I'm, I'm gonna try to pass it along to you. The first thing I wanna show you is that, uh, you know, before, before we get to the Bar Kokhba coins, I wanna give you a very quick review uh, of what uh, the, the Judean coins of the, uh, the earlier Judean coins of the second temple period looked like. So first I remind you of these Yehud coins uh, and lest you think that they look like tetradrams, this is their actual size, right? They are uh, uh, generally a, a, a fifth of a gram to a, a half of a gram each. And then we have the, uh, uh, the uh, Maccabean coins, the Hasmonean coins. They carry inscriptions in Paleo-Hebrew, uh, in Aramaic, and in Greek. Uh, and um, uh, this is Aramaic, and uh, they, they have symbols that are not uh, necessarily Jewish symbols, but they're not necessarily foreign uh, uh, to, uh, 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 to Jews. They're not offensive to Jews. Uh, one of the uh, things uh, that the Maccabeans portrayed on their coins were these uh, uh, temple implements, the menorah and the showbread table. And in fact, that's the only time during the Herodian or the Hasmonean periods that we can point to an absolute Jewish design uh, on uh, the coins rather than something that was adapted from something Greek. Um, the uh, the co coins of Herod the Great only had Greek legends, no Hebrew, no Aramaic. Um, and uh, they started off uh, being without uh, uh, graven images, but they ended up uh, by the uh, middle Herodians, they were carrying portraits of not only the Roman emperors, but the Herodian kings themselves. There's, then we come to the Jewish war and the Bar Kokhba war, where we see a completely different sort of coinage. Here, uh, the coins, uh, uh, for, for the first time, we have silver coins. And for the second time, uh, uh, after the menorah coin, in both cases, we have um, uh, symbols that are very closely related to Judaism. It's very hard to see how uh, uh, a lulav and an etrog uh, shown right here on a Bar Kokhba coin, or the facade of the Jerusalem temple, or a, a pomegranate branch, those, those aren't attributes of Demeter or, or some Greek uh, goddess or god. The, these are Jewish things and they have very, very Jewish slogans and we're gonna, we're gonna get there. But I just wanted you to have an overview uh, before we began. And the other thing that I wanted to point out to you, which I think that many of you probably don't know is that between the first revolt and the Bar Kokhba revolt, there was a major devaluation uh, of money in the area. During the Jewish war uh, and before that time, there, there were four uh, drachmas or denarii to a shekel or a tetradram. So that was a tire shekel or a Judean shekel. They were both the same weight of 14 grams. Um, but during the Bar Kokhba period, which we only learned from the Bar Kokhba letters, we read that the money, which is 10 denarii, equals two tetradrams and one shekel. That means that the shekel was only two drachmas by the time of Bar Kokhba 60 years later. Now, the first instinct that students of Judean coins have when they're faced with this is to say that's impossible. 
because they would never devalue the shekel dues. Uh, that's probably true, but the problem is that the temple was destroyed in 70 CE, and this was 62 years later, and the Jewish tribute tax that was paid went to the emperor. So I guess they didn't have a problem devaluing it. And indeed, this very rare coin that I'm showing you down here, the Bar Kokhba diadram, is in fact the Bar Kokhba shekel. So just to clarify and to remind you, I want to show you here that uh, what the Bar Kokhba letters tell us is that uh, four, uh, 10 denarii equals two tetradrams and one shekel. So four denarii equals one tetradram, four denarii equals one tetradram, two denarii equals one Bar Kokhba shekel. And look, the, the little Zeus becomes the half shekel of the Bar Kokhba period. Uh, we never refer to it that's what, that way, but in fact, that's exactly what it is. Uh, Bar Kokhba also issued these large bronzes uh, they're called Abu Jara, not for any Bar Kokhba reason, but because Abu Jara in Arabic means father of the jar. And it's very common uh, uh, for uh, uh, Arab men uh, in Jerusalem to be nicknamed uh, the father of their first son. So at some point, somebody jokingly called this coin the father of the jar and it stuck. That's why they're called Abu Jara. And of course, Bar Kokhba also issued a large group of uh, types of bronze coins from the middle bronzes uh, and the large bronzes uh, 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 to the small bronzes. Uh, and uh, the, one of the things that they have in common is that they are all, sorry, I'm gonna go back a second. But one of the things they have in common is that all of these coins are overstruck on existing money. And we're going to discuss that uh, in just a moment. That's not, by the way, not 92%, not 87%, not 96%, but 100% of the Bar Kokhba coins were struck on already circulating money. It becomes significant as the story goes on. So this guy Bar Kokhba, we know from his letters that he was a very meticulous and strict commander who never ceased from threatening his subordinates with punishments if his orders were not followed. He was really, really concentrating on the tiniest, tiny detail uh, uh, rather than the big picture. Uh, and the, the letters really make it clear. And his legacy uh, is that, you know, early on uh, in, uh, even in the 60s and the 70s, the scholarship of Bar Kokhba was to talk about what a wonderful guy he was, what a, a great revolutionary he was. There's a lot of rethinking uh, among uh, Israeli uh, uh, intellectuals about this. And in fact, I point out here that a current study uh, guide uh, at the Israel Museum asks whether the Bar Kokhba revolt was a symbol of heroism and uh, a readiness and ability to fight for national freedom or a careless act that brought upon a national disaster for the Jews at the end of the Second Temple period. So the first question when we, when we take a big, big picture look at the Bar Kokhba coins is why did they mint? Well, it, oh, sorry, I uh, this somehow got out of place. But uh, so I wanted to show you that all Bar Kokhba coins were struck on coins from circulation, right? They, and because they were struck from coins already in circulation, they're a little bit unusual because they cost more to produce than they're worth. Why is that? Well, because if you ordinarily want to produce, let's say, a tetradram like this one from scratch, you start with a lump of metal that costs a discounted price from the eventual value of the coin, right? The seniorage. Uh, however, um, in the case of a Bar Kokhba coin, they basically had to buy this from the market, quote, buy from the marketplace for the cost of one tetradram. And then it had the added cost of reproducing the coin. And there wasn't any uh, a fiduciary value that they could gain there, presumably, uh, except a maybe, maybe a small value among a small group of people. Anyway, so we were so uh, before I got this slide out of place, I was talking about the reason to mint. So 
Uh, oh, I'm still on these. Okay, well, uh, to show you, not only did they strike strictly on Roman provincial coins, but here's a Bar Kokhba that was struck on top of a Ptolemaic coin. Here's one that was apparently struck on top of a Mattathias Antigonus uh, large bronze. And here's one that was struck upon a, uh, a Pruta size coin. Uh, so, uh, okay. So the reasons to mint in ancient times were varied and we don't fully understand them from a modern perspective because we tend to apply uh, too much of what we do and know to the past. But let's try it here according to some traditional numismatic scholarship. The reasons to mint were military payments. You could use the money for military payments. There were religious obligations. You could pay dues to a temple. You would create a profit. There was definitely profitability in making money from the raw materials more or less at different times and different places, but there was generally a profit uh, for the, uh, the governing body who issued the coins and to facilitate trade. Okay, so let's look at how these applied to, uh, to Bar Kokhba. Bar Kokhba's need for coins, first of all, these are the needs for coins that I first mentioned to you. So Bar Kokhba's needs for coins, well, first of all, there was no shortage of currency to pay the army because we know that all of the coins that Bar Kokhba overstruck were coins that were already in circulation. So there was no need for money for military payments. Um, in the case of uh, religious reasons, there was no temple. There was no temple, so they did, unlike the situation in the first revolt, they needed to make money to continue to pay the obligation to the temple and it needed to be silver and it needed to be parallel uh, uh, to the size of the tire coins, but that didn't exist. So they could create a profit, but Bar Kokhba couldn't create a profit because those coins, as I just showed you and explained, had a negative fiduciary value. Maybe it was only negative 2% or 1%, but it was, it was not the kind of positive 3% or 5% fiduciary value that could be picked up otherwise. And they did Bar Kokhba need the, uh, the coinage to facilitate trade? No, because as we explained up here in point one, there was plenty of coinage already in circulation. So let me ask you, why did Bar Kokhba strike coins? Because he had a critical need to distribute his political message. He was a small movement in a small place and he needed to get the word out to the followers, even if they were within a hundred mile radius. I mean, can you imagine the place where Bar Kokhba was fighting against the Romans was really very small. It was limited to a small area uh, in Judea, uh, not even including Jerusalem. And yet it was important for him to issue coins with these messages to get the messages out into the hands of the people, even if they were only 30 or 40 miles away. Because one of the things that we've learned a lot about Bar Kokhba in the last 20 years is that, you know, we talk about underground movements. Bar Kokhba's movement was a truly underground movement. And a great many of the people lived regularly underground, in caves, in hiding places. And there was a very sophisticated system of these uh, caves uh, throughout Judea uh, in the area, especially where uh, uh, Bar Kokhba uh, hid from the Romans and struck at the Romans. Uh, by the way, I, it, it, I wanted to especially show you this coin because it, it's so interesting. This is a uh, Judea capta, uh, you recognize a, a Vespasian denarius. And here is a Bar Kokhba Zeus, which you can now feel free to call a Bar Kokhba half shekel, uh, overstruck on the identical type coin right here. Um, and here's the Judea that's very clear. People would really, really like to uh, have us believe that these were deliberate things to show that the Jews were uh, uh, disrespecting the Romans uh, at this time, especially in these cases. My own view is that in 55 years, I've seen maybe three or four coins like this where it's overstruck on a, a coin of Judea. 
CAPTA. And uh, I, I want to think that if they were doing it on purpose, there would be a whole lot more. So uh, my expectation is that that coin is probably proportionate to the number of coins that are just being overstruck anyway. Uh, and they're being overstruck by the minting authorities. Uh, the question though is in the, in, the, in the case of Judea in general, who are the minting authorities? Well, in the Jewish war, there was no minting authority. Uh, the coin said shekel of Israel and uh, Jerusalem the holy. So, you know, you know, neither Israel nor Jerusalem was the actual minting authority. Uh, we, we think it was, you know, uh, authority of the temple, um, but it doesn't say that on these coins. Um, during the Bar Kokhba war, though, we, ha we have the names of minting authority. Some of the coins carry the name of Simon and his title, Prince of Israel. And some of the coins carry the name Eliezer the priest, Eleazar HaKohen. And there has been a lot of scholarly discussion about Eleazar HaKohen. Let me just mention to you, Simon, Prince of Israel, the word here uh, that we translate as prince is Nasi, uh, Shimon Nasi Yisrael. Uh, Nasi is the modern Hebrew word for president. So the president of Israel today is known as Nasi Yisrael. Uh, uh, there, there was no real president, but you know maybe he was a president or prince of some kind of council of Jews. Uh, and then uh, 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 we, we take a look at Bar Kokhba's name. Uh, his name was only assumed to be Simon from the coins. And there, it was controversial. Not all the early writers said those were Bar Kokhba coins. And it was only when the Bar Kokhba letters were first discovered in 1961, when they revealed his name as Bar Kosiba. And uh, I, I just want to say that those letters were found in 61, and a lot of them were translated and published, uh, especially in English, uh, very slowly. Uh, so it was maybe 20 years, but still that was in the 80s when most of the letters were available. Yet it's only been recently that scholars have been really working to incorporate the content of those letters from the period written actually by Bar Kokhba uh, and or his immediate minions that, they, that we've begun to merge the content of those letters with the archeological uh, 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 artifacts and with the coins. Uh, and my friend Boaz Zissou uh, uh, in uh, Tel Aviv University uh, who you'll meet later on in this lecture uh, uh, is in the forefront of that, as was his, his teacher, my friend Hanan Eshel. So, so after the discovery of the letters, they realized that all of the coins that said Simon were Bar Kokhba's coins. So his actual name in the letters was Bar Kosiba in Aramaic. And in Hebrew, we say that as Ben Kosiba, son of Kosiba. So the Bar Kokhba name, where does that come from? Well, it may come from his uh, ally, Rabbi Akiva, describing him by quoting, there shall step forth a star out of Jacob, which is a quote from the uh, from Book of Numbers. Uh, the other interesting thing is that a very similarly pronounced word, not Bar Kosiba, but Bar Kosiba, was a derogatory name used by his distractors after his revolt uh, uh, failed. Bar Kosiba, Bar Koziba means son of a lie, son of the lie. So uh, as I say, Bar Kokhba at different times was looked at in different ways. And in many of the Talmudic period writings, he was uh, 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 look, looked at in a, in a very derogatory way. Um, now the next question is, so who is this other person that's mentioned, Eliezer the priest? That's something that I've been extremely interested in uh, and have, have written uh, and studied uh, on it for quite a number of years. And these are in general, 
the people that were thought to have gotten a place on Elliot, on, on Bar Kokhba's coins. One of these guys, maybe. Personally, I say, no way, no way. It, uh, uh, Bar Kokhba was much too much of a micromanager to let somebody else's name on his coins. And the entire theme of his coins is messianic. So if Eliezer HaKohen was a living person at the time of Bar Kokhba, then his mention is unique among the legends and imagery of Bar Kokhba, all of which referred to an idealized resurrection of the Jewish temple cult in Jerusalem. The only exception to that is the coins that name Bar Kokhba himself. And as I said earlier and already a couple of times, he was such an egomaniac micromanager that there's no way that a personality like his would mention another human being on the coins. And uh, so I say that the invocation of names or images of glorious leaders or gods or goddesses or heroes from the distant past or the mythical past was common in Greco-Roman coinages before, during, and after the Bar Kokhba War. And I think that the, the name Eliezer the priest, like all of the other images and slogans on the Bar Kokhba coins, refer to a glorious past and a messianic approach to the future. And therefore, I conclude that Eliezer the priest is a messianic and heroic reference to Eliezer, the son of Aaron, uh, who was a person that every Jew at that time, and indeed every Jew in this time who had any kind of a, a Hebrew school or Sunday school or Bible education knows who Eliezer of the Bible was. Uh, and we have to assume that that was true at that time as well. So uh, this is my view. Uh, I've written it. Uh, nobody's really disputed it, but of course it's a kind of thing that we can never really know for sure. Um, another interesting messianic thing that I would like to show you about Bar Kokhba coins is this very interesting uh, reference to this prayer, which is often referred to as the watchword of Judaism. In Hebrew, it's Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. And the first word of that prayer is also the namesake of that prayer, Shema. And this is how it's spelled, Shin Mim Ayin. Uh, and here it is, right here on Bar Kokhba's coins. You would say, wow, he put Shema on his coins. Well, he did. But, uh, uh, you know, one, one, and, and don't think that Bar Kokhba wasn't uh, uh, religious or superstitious enough to use it. Uh, the, uh, the Talmud, the Midrash tells us that one of his prayers uh, before he went into battle was, God, neither help us nor discourage us. And that also started with uh, Hashem uh, or, or Shema. Uh, and uh, what, what we have here is a, um, a, a, a very interesting play of words. The word Shema are the first three letters of his first name, Shimon. Now, certainly this is coincidental, but once the coincidence was realized and recognized, especially at the beginning of the revolt, when everything was extremely messianic, he created a number of coins that used only the Shema letters, Shema, 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 right in order and everything. And at the same time, there were also coins uh, uh, that have the full name of Shimon, although the Shema coins tend to be earlier uh, when uh, Bar Kokhba was more in his heyday and feeling his oats more. This is the same, uh, uh, th this obverse die uh, first appears with these Eliezer coins and then moves on uh, uh, to uh, the year two, other the clear year two coins. Uh, and uh, there are a very few hybrid of the same dies with year three coins. It's very rare uh, because surely those dies were damaged and not much used any longer. But look, it's just such a very clear difference. You know, sometimes he calls himself Simon, Simon, Shimon, Shimon is double struck. 
Shimon, Shimon, but here he says Shema, Shema, Shema. It's very, very interesting, um, but it fits. Now, uh, so Bar Kokhba doesn't say that he is uh, the pre president of Judea, no. Uh, Judah was a, a territory that was referred to on the little tiny Yehud coins that I told you about. And Judah, or the Judeans, uh, were referred to on the Hasmonean coins. But once we get to the first revolt and the Bar Kokhba revolt, we have no more references to Judea. So why do you think that is? Well, my view, and a lot of, a lot of people agree with, with this viewpoint, is that the Jews didn't want to reinforce the name that the Romans gave to their land. It was originally Judah. Uh, the Romans named it uh, uh, Judea, the province of Judea, and uh, the Jews wa wanted to switch that off politically. And so one of the ways that they tried to switch it off politically was by never using uh, the name Judea uh, as a reference point on coins, on correspondence, on letters. And when it came down to coming up with a slogan for their coins, uh, it was not something uh, explanatory like shekel of Israel. On the other hand, it was something declaratory. This was the year one of the redemption of Israel. And over here it says Simon Shimon Nasi, Simon Prince of Israel. And indeed the Bar Kokhba coins were among the pioneers of early Zionistic slogans. Uh, as I said, the year one of the redemption of Israel. Uh, uh, the use of Jerusalem, and by the way, this use uh, of Jerusalem on the coin, oh, let me go back, sorry. The use of Jerusalem on the coin, I may, I may mention this again in a second, sorry, uh, is a, a, um, aspirational because Bar Kokhba never uh, uh, won any battle or land in or very near to Jerusalem. He never controlled even a part of Jerusalem. And in all of the excavations uh, in Jerusalem by the Israelis since 1967, many, many thousands of coins were discovered. And of those thousands of coins, three, and maybe last year, another one, four poor bronze coins of Bar Kokhba were discovered. No other Bar Kokhba coins discovered in Jerusalem. And these were very scattered and everybody assumes that they were souvenirs in, in Roman pockets uh, after the war. Uh, no, nobody thinks that any Bar Kokhba coins circulated uh, or were struck in uh, the immediate Jerusalem area. Uh, another Bar Kokhba slogan, the year two of the freedom. Uh, it's, it's also interesting that we change from the word year one of the redemption and now we're talking about year two of the freedom of Israel. And uh, uh, by the third year, by, uh, by the way, we're not even talking about the freedom or redemption of Israel. We've gotten down to uh, only the freedom of Jerusalem. They've set their sights a lot lower. And as I said, uh, from history, we know that uh, it didn't work out for Jerusalem either. But that is the inscription for the freedom of Jerusalem, for the freedom of Jerusalem. Uh, so that's what they look like. And as I say, the, there are more aspirational uh, references to Jerusalem on the Bar Kokhba large bronzes, on the other side of the year two large bronze. And uh, uh, realistically, there was a language barrier. Uh, the language used on uh, the Bar Kokhba coins was totally a dead uh, uh, script at the time of Bar Kokhba. Even during the time of the Maccabees, uh, it was already out of uh, uh, mode uh, and it was a throwback. So what, what's it all about? Why did they use this old script? Well, this old script, uh, which was script from the time of the Iron Age, from the time of King David, from the time of the glorious days of the Jewish kingdom. And this is a script that apparently was very often used by the Jews in subsequent generations to evoke the greatness of that period. And so here we have uh, Psalm 138 from the Dead Sea Scrolls 
And we see that it's written in what we call Aramaic, basically, which is square Hebrew. It looks like Hebrew today, but one word, they're highlighted in blue here, uh, and it's the name of God. And the name of God is written in Paleo-Hebrew script, obviously to highlight the, uh, the holiness and the importance. The Jewish shekel weights from the Iron Age, uh, from the 8th and 7th centuries BC, carried inscriptions in this very script. Uh, and, uh, Pim, Netzef, and Becca, the, the three of the denominations uh, of uh, uh, Hebrew denominations of the Judean weight system. And also, of course, the famous, famous scroll that was discovered uh, at Ketef Hinnom. Uh, and uh, it carries the, uh, uh, the, the blessing, the, the pre we call it the priestly ble blessing. And I have never been to a church service or a synagogue service where this blessing has not been invoked at least one time. Uh, may the Lord bless you and keep you, may he cause his faith to shine upon you and be gracious unto you and grant you peace. Amen. And this was found uh, at, as I said, the Ketef Hinnom excavations, I'll tell you a little side story. This piece was rolled up as they often are, and it's made on very thin silver and it was totally corroded. Uh, I saw photographs of it. It looked like a, a broken up kind of a piece of a cigarette. And it sat in a cigar box of pieces, odds and ends that were found at this excavation near Jerusalem. Yaakov Meshurer at the time was the chief curator of archaeology, and he noticed it. And the one thing that struck him was that he didn't know exactly what it was, but it had the same patina as a silver coin. So that m made him think that maybe it was silver and discussed it with the archaeologist, who was Gabby Barkai. They sent it to the laboratory to be treated as a piece of silver, and that's when they discovered it was a scroll and they were able to unroll it and uh, uh, today, uh, uh, it's one of the earliest uh, known Hebrew inscriptions uh, on display at the Israel Museum. Uh, but it was, as I say, it was holy objects. And people, you know, I can imagine that people would say, hey, can you read what that says? And the guy says, no, I can't read what it says. It's not the language that I read. And the guy says, I'll tell you what it says. It says, for the freedom of Jerusalem. Oh, and then that guy tells another guy, this says the freedom of Jerusalem. And then it becomes a talking point. So once you get a talking point going with your circulating coinage, uh, th this leads to very excellent and interesting communications. Well, not only did the uh, Bar Kokhba uh, government try to communicate using a, uh, an obscure language, but they also tried to get uh, communications going by way of symbols. Uh, and in the back of everybody's mind was this little phrase from Exodus that the Jews have followed or not followed, depending on what kind of threats they were under. I mean, we see many synagogues, the famous synagogue of Dura Europus, uh, other mosaics in other synagogues that have plenty of graven images, but um, you won't find too many graven images from uh, uh, the second temporal period when the Jewish uh, people were under an existential threat and they were clinging to certain very specific uh, things. And so Bar Kokhba was challenged uh, uh, to not do what the, uh, the small uh, rulers around him were doing uh, and put his face on a coin and say how great he was or anything like that. So they had to figure out another way. So first we have these symbols, uh, which I mentioned earlier, they're not overtly Jewish. Uh, the, they come from Greek gods and goddesses. This is the uh, Rose of Rhodes, uh, uh, um, this a very Greek anchor. Um, but there, none of these symbols were offensive to the Jewish population, and they were able to be adopted into the Jewish population. And to be honest, a great deal of the Jewish population probably didn't even know that they were not Jewish symbols. You know, some people would obviously know that the poppy is an attribute of Demeter, for example, but uh, not everybody is going to know that. 
So th they, were, they were not overtly Jewish. But once we get to uh, the first revolt and the Bar Kokhba revolt, there's no doubt that almost all of the images are very, very specifically Jewish. Uh, here we have the lulav and etrog on the Bar Kokhba cella. And here is a lulav and etrog right off the uh, street from a celebration of Sukkot in, in the 2000s. And here is a, uh, a fourth century or fifth century uh, mosaic uh, uh, synagogue floor with the same motif. And again, a Jewish war coin with the same uh, motif, two etrogs and a lulav. And, uh, and those are very specific to the holiday of tabernacles uh, in Hebrew Sukkot. Um, also, another symbol that was used was the symbol of the temple itself. After all, the temple had been gone for 62 years. So the Jews were already into probably the second generation of Jews who did not have a Jerusalem temple focused basis to their religion, but they were longing for it. And this was obviously part of their tradition at the time. And Bar Kokhba capitalized on it by trying to reproduce an image. And it probably was an image based on some graphics that were, were still held, drawings, or maybe people's memories or one generation away memories. But he very definitely had a temple uh, on those coins that resembled the temple in Jerusalem. And this one is the model of uh, Jerusalem that originally was built for the Holy Land Hotel and now stands in uh, the Israel Museum. And here it is, the temple uh, on these coins. And you'll notice that it really has a very similar look. You have a Tetra style temple, right? And then uh, there, there's a pediment up here. Now above the pediment, we have either a, uh, a cross, a uh, rosette, a star, or a wavy line. And uh, a, a lot of people have sort of put that off uh, as not being very meaningful. I, I actually think they're quite meaningful. Uh, and I also want to talk about this object right here, which is often discussed as a, uh, oh, sorry, let me go back to these first. So the star and the wavy line uh, and the rosette, um, to, uh, to me, uh, there are many writings that explain that the entrance to the temple, and this is just a schematic drawing of the entrance to the temple, that above the entrance to the temple was a candelabra that was donated to the Jerusalem temple by Queen Helena of Adia Beni, uh, who was buried in, in the tomb of the kings uh, in Jerusalem, and that this uh, chandelier when it was lit, obviously it was an oil chandelier, was so bright that it uh, could be seen sparkling from all over Jerusalem. So it seems to me that it's very logical that if it sparked a light throughout Jerusalem, you could represent that either with a rosette or a cross. Um, uh, likewise, this wavy line, which people really dismissed uh, for years, is very likely related to this uh, uh, um, golden vine that we know uh, from uh, Josephus that Herod the Great donated to the temple to hang over and around the, um, the entrance to the temple and that people used, uh, on, on which people hung donatives. Uh, and those donatives were usually in the form of uh, grape leaves uh, or bunches of grapes, or if you weren't that rich, you could maybe donate a single grape. And here we have this represented very nicely on the coins with these lovely <coughs> bunches of grapes and vine leaves from both the first revolt and the Bar Kokhba revolt. It's all very closely related to the messianic story that uh, the, te the, the Jerusalem will be rebuilt and the temple will be, be rebuilt. Now, to talk about the object inside, sorry, I, I was a little out of order. Uh, this sure, sure looks 
like a Torah shrine. This is a Torah shrine from the Du Europa Synagogue. And uh, maybe there was a shrine like this in the temple. Oh, sorry, no. You see, there was no, um, uh, 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 there was no uh, uh, Torah scrolls in the second temple because it was, uh, uh, the Holy Ark was destroyed when the first temple was destroyed or disappeared and it never reappeared. So the second temple did not have a holy ark of the covenant. Uh, and um, the idea that Bar Kokhba put something like that in there is once again, pretty clearly a messianic reference uh, to the first temple time. Now, uh, by the way, Dan Barag, my, one of my teachers and friends did not agree with that. He thought that this represented a showbread table which was inside the temple. Uh, and he saw the showbread table as potentially looking like this. And this being the end view or this being the end view, both of which are very similar to what we see here. In my opinion, this is an arc, a, a, a showbread table that was built uh, uh, to have an end like this. Uh, we have no archeological evidence from this. So I don't think it's correct. And, and by the way, uh, other people have actually represented this as a showbread table. And as you can see here, it looks much more like a table. Um, uh, actually, I just noticed this coin is upside down, by the way. This, <laughs> this is upside down and uh, this is right side up, however. Um, anyway, the other thing that I would like to call to your attention on the coins of the, uh, uh, especially the second revolt is that I have never really seen a palm tree that has more than seven branches on a Bar Kokhba coin. Now, during the Jewish war, you have trees like this with eight, nine, 10 branches. But in the Bar Kokhba war, we only have seven branches on palm trees. And I cannot help but uh, make a parallel between that and the uh, seven branched uh, uh, menorah uh, that also existed in the temple. And maybe Bar Kokhba did not want to, uh, you know, reproduce an object of the temple per se on his coins, but chose to uh, reference it by using the seven branched palm tree. And as I say, I, if I saw 80% uh, of the palm trees with seven branch and the others with six, nine, 10, four, but I just don't see it. I see seven all the time. Uh, and then, of course, uh, uh, we have uh, Bar Kokhba uh, trumpets, which was another symbol that he used for uh, communication. The trumpets were on the coin. And uh, here you can see very clearly they're uh, the same shape uh, trumpets that are here carried by uh, uh, the soldiers in this uh, parade with the spoils of the temple. And we're also reminded of this uh, uh, object that was found in the ruins of the uh, uh, Herod's temple, which is uh, Aramaic carved in uh, limestone over a lintel, uh, probably on the roof uh, to the place of the trumpeting where the priests probably trumpeted uh, at the beginning uh, and end of Sabbath and other holidays. Um, so, uh, so the trumpets and all the musical instruments of Bar Kokhba are important because to the Jews, the musical instruments were all connected with temple worship. And here you see something from Psalms. I mean, it's very frank, you know, uh, uh, praise him with lyre and harp. Now, I, I would like to also point out to you that the Bar Kokhba coins just because of their value as symbols of a free or a struggling to be free religious group um, attached to a particular city. Um, and many of the coins were worthless. So uh, they didn't all get melted down. The bronzes didn't get melted down. And many of them recirculated, even some of the silver coins. And here, Early on in the 60s, a large percentage, 50s and 60s, a large percentage 
of the Bar Kokhba Zuz coins that were seen were pierced. And it was finally recognized that these had been pierced in times after the Bar Kokhba War, going right up to medieval times and were worn by people as uh, Jewish charms uh, or amulets. And uh, many of them uh, are so interesting because Bar Kokhba's Zuzim show very specific flat edges, but all of the coins that are pierced don't have flat edges. And it was very, very weird to look at these things. And uh, uh, Yaakov Mesherer, my teacher, figured it out that because they were worn and handled and all that, that they were rounded smooth uh, uh, just by rubbing and by wear. And indeed, I have never seen a pierced Bar Kokhba uh, uh, zoos with, with flat edges. And on the right side, I would like to show you a very similar phenomenon. You'll say, wait a minute, those aren't pierced. Well, no, this is even more interesting. This is a hoard of coins that was found uh, in the West Bank in the uh, early 1970s inside this very piece of broken Herodian oil lamp. And here were four Roman aurei, five Roman denarii, and seven Bar Kokhba bronzes, all with matching patina. Uh, of course, the gold did not have patina, although there were a few flecks of matching green uh, on the gold and, and also inside the pottery. And based on the date of the latest coin here, uh, which is a denarius of Antonius Pius, which is right here, this was hidden after 152 CE. Now, so this was 17 years after the Bar Kokhba War, and the individual who owned this was worth four aurei and five denarii. So these little seven pieces of bronze change that had been invalidated were totally and completely worthless. Well, not so fast. What did this guy have in his little collection of money? He had a year one Bar Kokhba bronze with a liar, a year two with the same design, a year three with the same design. Hey, collectors, are you listening to me? This guy is a fellow traveler, man. He was a coin collector and he collected these uh, also little odds and end bronzes. He had been collecting his Bar Kokhba coins since the war was over and he was saving it with his most precious items. I, I, it, it's mind blowing to me. Uh, and of course the Bar Kokhba dating formulas, which we've just mentioned, the, the coins are dated either one or two, or they're not dated. And I think it's just because, uh, uh, first of all, we know that the not dated coins uh, uh, go with year three because one of my uh, uh, good friends and teachers, Leo Mildenberg did uh, uh, the dye study and explained uh, how the dyes were linked and how uh, the year ones clearly did come first, the year twos clearly did come second, and the year threes clearly did come uh, third, and there were some hybrids uh, along the way. Um, but by the third year, they were in pretty dire straits. And so I think that they sort of were a little bit wary of dating their struggle uh, anymore. And so they just went for kind of an everlasting slogan of Jeru uh, 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 the freedom of Jerusalem. Now, we would be amiss if we didn't also talk about the Roman commentary on Bar Kokhba. Uh, and actually, it was sort of pre-commentary because these coins were uh, struck before the Bar Kokhba conflict. Uh, Hadrian took his trip in 130 uh, uh, from Arabia to uh, Egypt via Judea and struck the Cistercius uh, and uh, uh, the Dupandius or ass of uh, slightly different styles uh, 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 and types, but mainly uh, Advensi al Judea, uh, the emperor's adventures in Judea, both carry the same legend. And uh, also uh, uh, on that trip, apparently before the Bar Kokhba War, Hadrian uh, 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 founded. Uh, the city of Jerusalem refounded it with the name of Aelia Capitolina with the legend uh, Kol, Kol, 
Al, Al, Capit, Capit, Cole, Alia, Capitolina, Cond, C O N D, the foundation of that city. And here's our friend Hadrian. And so, just, you know, uh, to conclude, I just want to point out that the first and the second revolts were the, really the only time that the Jewish people struck on their coins very bold statements of Jewish sovereignty. And I mentioned earlier my friend Boaz Zissou, and I know that every collector that's watching this and even the scholars are jonesing for field work. My last field work was in 2011, and I wish I was uh, back at it. Uh, this is my friend Boaz Zissou, and he's excavating the cave of the Tiamim, the cave of the twins in the Western Judean Hills. Now, the interesting thing is that this was a looted cave that they decided to go back into. You can see that Boaz is very much at home in caves. And uh, right there in one of the cracks, he found this. Uh, this uh, uh, he shined his flashlight in and he saw this. And uh, these are Orii and uh, just, just, just by the way, uh, so that dirt will be washed off with water, but this corrosion uh, will have to be taken off with acid. And those are all Bar Kokhba uh, tetradrams, uh, Salaim or two shekel pieces. And here is what that hoard looked like after cleaning. And, you know, ordinarily you would look at this, oh, these are pretty ordinary coins, but uh, take a look at this coin that I'm circling right here, A18. A18, there's two of them here, A18. And look at the, at the area that's apparently the arc that we discussed. And look here on, on there's one dot in the center. Now on every other Bar Kokhba coin, there are two dots, which people have always assumed to be the end of scrolls or the end of uh, a stand. Yet on this coin, it's an irregular coin and there's only one dot. And I have to tell you that, and I've said this before, if somebody showed me that coin and just said, hey, look at this coin, my immediate instinct would be to say that it was fake. And I don't think that this type, this, this die is known from any place else except this single hoard. Uh, it's really quite, quite remarkable. Uh, and there was another Tiamim hoard, uh, hoard B. Uh, and I, I like to show this one for a very special reason. Uh, uh, actually two very special reasons. This was the first hoard, and, and my friend Boaz found this, the first hoard where it was basically a Bar Kokhba period hoard where a Jewish war coin was found in the hoard. You see, numismatists for years have speculated that the Bar Kokhba coins look something like the Jewish war coins. And even though they don't have the same slogans, the letter forms and a lot of things are similar but nobody could ever find a hoard of coins that contained both. And so there was no proof. And this was the first one. There, there has subsequently been another one, but this was quite remarkable when it was found. And there are two other fantastic things about this hoard. But one is that again, a hoard of money that has you know, a tetradram, two tetradrams and three or four or five, six drams. What, what else did they keep in, the, in this valuable hoard? his bronze, their bronze sewing needle, because it wasn't easy to get good clothes in those days and you had to be <clears throat> quick with your needle to repair them and it wasn't so easy to find a needle. And what else did this guy have? And this is put down no earlier than the time of Domitian, okay? So that's 81 uh, 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 or after, uh, no, sorry, uh, uh, Bar Kokhba. So this is 135 or after and here is a Hasmonean coin of, Alexander, of John Hyrcanus that was struck something like a hundred uh, two, well, it was struck something like 200 years before this group was put down. And it's in very poor condition. And this fellow who owned this money very obviously collected this Maccabean coin. This is another one of our early coin collecting brethren and in my mind, this is a smoking gun for a coin collector. So let's take a little summary of Bar Kokhba coins. The Bar Kokhba money was money of politics, not of necessity. The minting authority was Simon, the Prince of Israel. Eliezer was possibly a heroic reference to, a reference to the Old Testament Eliezer. 
The use of Shema was done, used by, El, 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 by Bar Kokhba, but was eliminated shortly after the first year, which coincidentally is the same time that the coin stopped referring to Eliezer, the Old Testament reference to Eliezer. And that's also the same time that certain rabbis started giving up on Bar Kokhba. Messianic Jewish motifs and legends on all of the coins. He continues the use of ancient Hebrew script, which was extremely rare except on coins at this time. The legends all mention Israel and never Judea. And last but not least, in 135 CE, Simon Bar Kokhba minted the last Jewish coins in the land of Israel until 1948. And that's what they look like then. Thank you very much. And if I, if I can answer questions, I'll be glad to. Thank see. you, David. So we're going to open it up to questions. Please feel free to unmute yourself. I'm just going to stop <coughs> your screen there. Um, at 111, I'm not sure what you were talking about at that point, but we have a question in the chat. Do we know that they bought the coins or were they seized from Roman garrisons and then overstruck for political reasons? It, uh, we don't know that from any uh, detailed or specific facts, uh, but uh, even though uh, Bar Kokhba uh, beat up on, uh, 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 on the Roman army uh, for the first year or uh, 18 months of the war, he, um, his men were in, in no, no way uh, staging major raids. And uh, the only way that this kind of uh, uh, money could have been ga uh, gathered, which would have been through the help of uh, uh, merchants and, uh, and, and very wealthy people, uh, and also all of the people just turning in their money. You know, as I told you, these, these people, the Bar Kokhba people lived very much like we have been living for the last year. They've been holed up, and instead of their houses and apartments, they've been holed up in caves, and they didn't come out of those caves. We didn't come out of our houses and apartments for somewhere between nine and, you know, 15 months. And Bar Kokhba's guys and uh, their families were holed up uh, for almost three years in these caves. And we don't know, you know, one or two caves, that's an exception. They have dozens and dozens of these caves that they're finding that have uh, 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 evidence of occupation by uh, uh, people in the time of Bar Kokhba, Jewish people. Very interesting. So I, 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 uh, there, there was no way enough that they could seize them. By, so by the way, just so, you know, we all know, I see who's here, and we all know that Bar Kokhba coins in general are scarce and Bar Kokhba silver coins are on the rare side. They're not like Athenian decadram rare, but they're a thousand dollar rare these days and, uh, and they're pretty rare. But I can tell you that when the, the big horde of Bar Kokhba came in the early 1970s, it was found by an Arab woman who was walking across a field carrying a bag on her shoulders and she stepped in a hole and dropped the bag and was very upset. And as she was gathering the vegetables that she had dropped, she realized that the hole that she fell into was like a little place where these coins had been buried and there were thousands and thousands of them. And it was the El Fawar hoard that Leo Mildenberg wrote about and the coins were gathered uh, you know, and photographed but they were dispersed and they went all over the market. Um, and there have been a few Bar Kokhba hoards but you know, he, if you look in Leo's book, you can see that there's no individual coin that exists in more than 50 or 75 examples. That means that at one time, those coins were really much more common, right? Because we know how many coins one die can create from a lot of the studies that have been coming out. Now, I have to assume that these were all sort of limited production. I mean, can you imagine if every Bar Kokhba die for every silver coin manufactured 30,000 coins for circulation in a 150 square mile territory, it would be unbelievable. So 
let's see, I'm just looking here at, couldn't they have captured, I mean, sir, I mean, they certainly could have captured Roman coins, that they, they certainly could have. I, I, I don't see references to that in any of the literature. As I say, there is references to the fact that the guy was being beaten up. Uh, no, I don't think that, Mel, I don't think that in, uh, uh, that in uh, the ancient world, a, uh, a star was ever uh, looked at as a forbidden graven image uh, in the ancient world. I think that that's anachronistic. Uh, we look at stars as holy in our society. I don't think that, uh, I, I think that, you know, stars were part, it was like the sun, the stars, the moon, everything was part of the solar system. But I do not think that those were uh, uh, considered to be graven images. Um, uh, there is no equivalent, uh, Don, to Josephus for Bar Kokhba. All we have is the Bar Kokhba letters. Now, I can highly recommend, there. Are, I think there are uh, one or two books. I think there might be a Yadin book. If you can find one of the books about the Bar Kokhba letters on, uh, at Abe Books or Amazon, they're really, uh, really, really fascinating. Uh, so, Evie, why are the Bar Kokhba shekels so rare? So, it's interesting, by the way, uh, half shekel, sorry. So, first of all, the Bar Kokhba half shekel, the didram. So, when I started doing this 55 years ago, we, we never knew about the coin. When Leo Mildenberg's book was published, we didn't know about the coin. We'd never heard of it. We never saw it. Shortly after Leo's book went to press, he was shown one of these coins by one of the uh, Arab dealers in Jerusalem. He was allowed to photograph it. And I don't even know exactly what happened to it, but there was then a big discussion about, you know, it looks like an irregular. Was it struck at the irregular mint or was it struck at the normal mint? Why is there only one? It must be fake. Leah says, it's not fake. I know what a Bar Kokhba coin looks like. <laughs> And this isn't fake. And those other of us who saw it, this doesn't look fake. Well, and in the last few years, two or three more have come out. And I, my explanation for the rarity, EB, is that it probably did come from one of the irregular mints. And I would say that 90% of the Bar Kokhba irregular dye coins are extremely rare. And it's not at all unknown to have three to five or fewer known examples of a particular um, irregular die. So that, that, that's my guess. I don't, I don't think it was a main issue, but it, it certainly is fascinating. Uh, uh, but it, a lot of it is explained by the fact that there, is, that there was no uh, temple. So is it known how the various bronze coins fit into sequence with the silver coins? Well, uh, the, 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 the bronze coins uh, uh, miles have either, there are either three or four denominations of the bronze coins. And it's a little bit hard to distinguish. We know that there is a Cistercia size and those are the large bronzes. And then we know that there is a small size that's pretty much like a semis and those are the small bronzes. And then there's another size that's somewhere between the Dupontius and the ass, but not exactly because they're provincial issues and not, uh, and not Roman issues that they're struck on. So there have been some uh, interesting articles written. The equivalence is essentially the same number of cistercii to the denarius as there would be as the number of Bar Kokhba large bronzes to the, uh, um, to, to, to the large, to the uh, Bar Kokhba tetradram. Uh, uh, I, I think it would be approximately the same. There are some specialty items, uh, some specialty articles that you can certainly look up. Um, Mike Beal, yes, production of year three coinage is high, certainly higher than the, that dated year two. Uh, first, where at least shekels were produced, peaked in year two and declined till year five. Well, uh, I think that, uh, that both situations were very dire at the end. Jerusalem was very dire at the end and Bar Kokhba was very dire at the end. The difference is that literally Jerusalem was at least in the middle of the temple, in the middle of the city. And they did continue to mint coins. And we, we certainly know that because 
there are enough known dyes of year five shekels that suggest that there were a lot of those year five shekels that were probably minted and taken away immediately as booty. Uh, and, and I attribute part of that to the rarity. But yet, on the other hand, in Bar Kokhba, in the third year, when things were dire, they started issuing more coins. So why is that? Well, I say that's because they were all doing the COVID thing and living and working at home. And in one of the museums in Jerusalem, I think it might have been the Tower of David Museum, I one time saw a little diorama exhibit which was a, a, a replica of what a mint looked like in Bar Kokhba's times. And there were two guys in a cave and you were looking at it from inside the cave toward the opening of the cave. And near the opening of the cave was a fire where they were heating, uh, you know, the things to cast the, uh, uh, to, uh, you know, to uh, heat up the coins and to strike and to cast. And then, then they, they, they had these tongs and one guy would take the coin after it was hammered down and heated up and put it in the dies and the other guy would strike it and flick it out. And that's the way they made coins. So listen, let me ask you something. If your job was to restrike coins and you happen to have a barrel full in your house at the beginning of COVID, how many weeks would it take you before you started restriking those coins? I mean, they didn't have anything else to do. They were hidden, they were locked down, they couldn't get anywhere. And there was a store of money because they did accumulate money, how, you know, however they did it, uh, you know, let's, let's just say it was a combination of, of all. They accumulated money and, and, and somebody had to restrike it. And so there could have been two guys working in a cave for 18 days after Bar Kokhba himself was already croaked. You know, you just can't, uh, you, 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 you just can't understand. And those coins, I mean, you take a look at Bar Kokhba silver coins. You can find some that aren't perfectly struck. You can find some that aren't perfectly centered. You can so find some that show the undertypes, but you can't find any that are heavily worn, except those Zuzim that the people wore around their neck and rubbed. Bar Kokhba coins struck in the third year simply did not circulate except maybe, maybe for a very short time in a very small area immediately after the Bar, until immediately after the Bar Kokhba War. Thanks. So let's see, what is the oldest host coin that has been identified? No, as I, I showed you a photo of Mattathias Antigonus and also Ptolemaic coins. So as far as I know that I've seen I've seen bronze coins struck on Ptolemaic coins, and I've seen silver coins struck on Nabataean coins, uh, and I've seen bronze coins struck on serrated uh, Ptolemaic bronzes. Uh, and, um, and Rick Bellison points out that most of the silver coins in circulation were drachmas, denarii, and tetragrams. And that is true, although, Rick, there were uh, quite a few uh, digrams of uh, Petra and uh, uh, the area that were struck and circulated uh, 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 from around the time of, of Hadrian. But I agree, it was a, a much less common uh, uh, piece. Is the scroll they unrolled the only, am uh, yes, that was the only example. It's extremely rare, it's unique in the world. It's at the Israel Museum and surely it was an amulet. Yes, it was. Uh, Bar Kokhba letters. Thank you, Mike. That's good. Yes, the Bar Kokhba. The, but if you, but but I'll tell you something. It's really great to look it up on the internet, and you can do a lot of research. But if you want to really enjoy it, get the book. I think it's by Yadin. Uh, you know, get one of the books that taught that tells you what's in the letters, but also talks about the experience of the guys who excavated the Bar Kokhba stuff and read the story about the president of Israel at the time, uh, uh, or the, he uh, sorry, the speaker of the Knesset, who was preparing to go to the president of Israel at the time with part of the annual report of all the things that were being done. And one of the things that he did was present progress in archeology. span And he started his presentation by saying, Mr. President, this was in the si uh, 60s, Mr. President, I have the honor of presenting to you 
documents from the immediate previous president of Israel, Simon Bar Kochba, <laughs> until 135 AD. Imagine the emotions that this uh, garnered in Israel. And it's no wonder that a lot of um, heroic uh, stories uh, rise up about uh, Bar Kokhba. But as I say, it depends on the times. You see, when the Jews are looking for, when the Jewish people look for a hero, you can find a hero in almost anywhere. As we know, not, nothing that we do in life is so clear cut. So many times you can be a hero or a villain at the same time. And uh, Bar Kokhba, in my mind, was both a hero and a villain. He did, you know, at the time, there was a concrete form of Judaism uh, <clears throat> that had been taken off by Rabbi Akiva when he left Jerusalem at the time of the Jewish war and, you know, from his yeshivas in Yavna. And there was a healthy Judean diaspora. But he chose to, you know, focus right there on the, the messianic issue of the Temple Mount. And he caused, uh, in, in, in a way, as I say, he hurt the Romans, but he caused real damage to his own people. Does that sound familiar? Hello? <laughs> uh, but, you know, I, it, it's, uh, it, 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 as I say, nothing, nothing is clear cut when you're telling these stories. The only uh, people that, uh, you know, the only things that we can read that are contemporary from Bar Kokhba are his letters or letters from people contemporary to him. And when you read his letters, you'll be shocked at the detail. I mean, you, I mean, okay, you know, our presidents don't do any details, but I mean, Bar Kokhba was like, you know, I want you to send 13 etrogs and 22 lulavs to the Jews in such and such a place. And it was like, he was obviously sending a special delivery to some cave somewhere. <laughs> and here he is, you know, the head of the whole movement dictating uh, uh, such a letter. And they're literally, uh, we don't know if they're, we assume that they're written by a scribe, but some of them may have been signed by himself. We don't know. Pretty cool autographs. Let's see. I think that's all the questions in the chat. Does anyone else have anything to ask? Yeah, wait, I had one other question here. There oh. is an inexact Byzantine, the use of Paleo-Hebrew, <clears throat> use of the Roman alphabet to write. Yes, that is that is true. That is that is very true. That is very true. Uh, it, the, I mean, the only thing is that, uh, that the, the Jewish people put real importance throughout their history in the prestige of the period of the G Judean monarchy. And that is where those letters come from. I mean, I guess you could say Byzantium was looking back toward the glory days of Rome. It might be similar, but, it, and it was the difference between hearkening back to Greek and using Latin, but, okay. Great to see everybody, people that I don't usually see. I see Linda and E.B. and hi, everybody, Michael. Gilles, are you in France? You're muted. You know, I'm still here. Oh, you're like still here, more. okay. Great presentation, thank you. Great to see Warren you, Dave. Esty, bye, names from my past. <laughs> Peter Tampa and the great Mel Wax, okay. Thank you, David. It was wonderful. Yeah, thank you, David. It was great. Let me just say, if any of you, if any of oh, I do want to say, if any of you want further references, send me emails and I'll send you links to specific references. The other thing is a whole lot of people asked me this week, so I'll tell you that the sixth edition of Guide to Biblical Coins is finished. Uh, uh, thank you, E.B., with a lot of help from E.B., uh, among other people. Uh, and, and it's uh, going to be going, the, the cover is being designed, it's going to the printer probably sometime in June, and it'll probably be available sometime in August. I've given the publishing rights and I've donated all the copyrights to the ANS. So when you buy your books, 100% of the money that you pay will be going to the ANS. Uh, if you buy it from the ANS, there's a membership discount. I'm not getting any royalties or anything, not that anybody 
does on numismatic books unless you publish them yourself, which I was smart enough to do for a while. Uh, anyway, uh, anyway, if you guys need uh, any references or you need anything, don't be shy. You know my email. And when's the seventh edition? The seventh edition. Yeah. <laughs> well, you, you know, people actually, I did a podcast yesterday promoting the sixth edition. And one of the questions I got asked is, why do you do a new edition? And, you know, because, you know, the, the first edition was only 45 years ago. How did you get to the sixth edition? Why didn't you just reprint it? And why aren't you on the second edition? Yeah. Well, you know, the answer is because, uh, because my real life business was in publishing. Uh, uh, my life beside numismatics was in publishing, I ha had a bit of an affinity and beginning with the second edition, I published it myself. And the reason that we, I would publish a new edition is each edition I would print 3000 copies. And when the 3000 copies were sold, I had a choice of either printing uh, another 500 or 1000 of the same book or doing what I knew how to do because I was a nutcase fanatic. I had been keeping up with every detail, every bit of scholarship, every bit of information, every bit of archeology. span So I kept updating it as, as, as we ran out. And that's how we got to sixth edition. And, and by the way, I'll tell you good news and bad news. The bad news is, sorry, the numbers did change. Uh, the good oh, news is that there is a really, really <laughs> detailed concordance at the back of the book that takes you not only through, and by the way, in six editions, I've only done, uh, this is my fourth set of numbers, and none of them overlap each other. So the first edition went up to 400, and then the second edition or the third edition went up from 500 to 1,000, and then the fifth edition started at 1,000, and now the sixth edition is starting at 6,000. Uh, but but there are changes because of chronology and other things. And I've also done away with the values. Uh, the values were really worthless uh, as soon as the book was published. And with the availability of databases today, anybody can learn the real value of any ancient coins quickly. But what you can't always learn is the true rarity. The value is not always the same as the true rarity. And I've carefully worked out uh, uh, originally with Arthur Houghton, and then I split it off to a, a version for Jewish coins only, a rarity scale that goes from C, C, two Cs up to three Rs. And it goes so from the most common to the most rare, and it's quite precisely defined as precisely as one can define these things. And there's a lot of interesting new stuff in it, so. All right, that's the advertisement. Join the ANS, oh, you're already <laughs> members, okay. Hi, Thank everybody. you, David. Thank you so much, David. Bye. Thank you for watching the American Numismatic Society's YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe. And if you like our online resources, publication, and events, you can support the Society by becoming a member. And don't forget to check out our book and eBay stores. The links are below.